In today's video, we are going to look at a case where someone is paying in $1 million per year to a whole life insurance policy with the goal of maximizing cash value. This will be an interesting case though, because as we progress through it, we are going to look at different what if scenarios. We work with just a handful of individuals that are funding policies at $1 million per year. It's more common to see seven or eight figures with corporations that are taking out policies on a number of executives or officers at their company. However, when individuals are looking at seven figure payments, what I will say is what we always like to look at our light, what if life happens scenarios. Because if we show here's a policy max funded at a million dollars per year, as you could imagine, the numbers will look pretty good. However, in the event something pops up, my cash flow is tied up, if I'm dedicating my resources elsewhere, whatever it might be, I want to make sure that the policy is A, set up properly for maximum cash value, but B, set up with a lot of flexibility. So what we're gonna look at today is a case for a 45-year-old individual and his goal is to pay $1 million per year into a policy for 10 years, 10 years maximum that is, but over 10 years, that gets $10 million into a cash value life insurance product, which will have a very high death benefit that can be used for estate planning and legacy planning. But the cash value, that's an attractive asset. What are the core benefits to a cash value life insurance product? Focusing on the cash value, safe, liquid, tax-free. This is the why as to why people are attracted to these products and why we see large dollar amounts going in like seven figures. And if you're looking at a smaller amount, the same thing applies here just relative to your numbers. The design you're going to see here can be used with any product. So goal here, for, before I get into the flexibility and the funding, maximizing cash value both upfront and long-term. So he wants both here. Very, very important to look at everything, which we're going to. Flexibility is important. Now on this piece, so if he wants a flexible policy where he's not obligated to pay a million bucks per year, the design's the most important piece. Where is your money going? Of that $1 million per year, so here's the total dollar amount over here, we've got 10% allocated toward the base premium. We're going to look at mass mutual examples in this video, so 10% is about as low as we can go. We've got a term rider, which the initial approximate cost is about $20,000, which is about 2% of the $1 million. So a very small, small amount of that 1 million going toward the term insurance rider, which that adds a lot more death benefit, which sets our MEC limit at a million dollars. What's the purpose of a term insurance rider? Cost effective way to add more life insurance, which raises the MEC limit, which allows me to reap the third core benefit of a cash value life insurance policy, being tax-free. If my policy becomes a MEC, then I do not get to access the cash value tax-free. The gains are taxable as ordinary income tax. I've got a potential penalty tax. Like, I don't want that. So in this case, purpose of the term, cost-effective way to raise the death benefit. Otherwise, I have to raise the base premium, which takes the biggest bite out of cash value. Then everything else, we're plowing into PUAs, the other $880,000. What I'll add about that term rider so if you do things right, it gradually decreases each year or as time passes, which allows a little bit more of my net payment, the million bucks, to go toward PUAs. So flexibility is important. Do you have to pay the $1 million every single year? Meaning if we set the policy up with your plan of paying $1 million per year for 10 years, are you going to get a bill for that every year and are you obligated to pay that? The answer is no. If the policy is set up properly. So what we're going to look at, look at here is a $1 million per year policy, meaning funding of $1 million per year. And the first thing we will look at, option one, best case scenario, million bucks per year for 10 years. What he thinks he can do, if he ends up funding it, it'll look beautiful. Number two, varying payments. What happens if he starts out with a million, then he decreases close to a minimal amount per year for a long period of time, and then scales back up to a million at the end. This will demonstrate flexibility of bouncing payments up and down, which is what you can actually do with these policies too. Then a life happens scenario. What if I get a million in initially, but then life happens and I can never get anywhere close to a million bucks per year. And then what does it look like if I want to stop funding early, meaning I don't wanna fund it for the full 10 years anymore. So let's take a look and have some fun, shall we? So 
First option, we've got best case scenario on the far left. What do we see here? Million dollars per year for 10 years. Annual outlay, this represents the total dollar amount going into the policy, base premium, term rider, PUAs, everything, million bucks. First year cash value, just about 90% right out of the gates. 89.7% to be precise, but very close to 90. And there's my death benefit, about 13.3 million initially. As I look at the funding here, so first year, that is a 10% hit. So granted it's rich upfront cash value, but it's still a 10% hit, which I'd look at this and say, okay, that's a hundred grand, no matter how I slice it. That's the drawback right there. With any policy, if it's 10 grand, the highest that would be would be about 9,000. Some products might be a little bit higher. Year two, he pays in a million bucks. It was 897. If he had 897 under his mattress and added a million to it, that mattress would then be worth 1.897. It's a little bit less than that, 1864. The reason why is because the expenses in the first two years are exceeding the gains on the policy. Higher expenses outweighing the earnings. Year three, pays in a million again. Was 1864, now it's 2907. So he got his $1 million back plus another $43,000 approximately. Year four, pays in a million, total of four million in the policy. Why it's highlighted in yellow, that's his break even point. And now it's starting to really pick up the pace. By year 10, he's got a gain of $1.8 million, pays nothing in after the 10th year, cash value continues to ride. And this is based on the present dividend interest rate. Let's take a look at the detailed illustration here, just so you can see exactly where everything's going. Because the Excel spreadsheet's great, but at the same time, like we wanna make sure all the data's here. It is important, at least initially. So we've got a 10 pay policy. Where's the money going? See up top where it reads annual, right here, annually. This provides a breakdown as to where everything is going. So on the far left, we've got base policy insurance. That's the whole life death benefit, 1.4 million. But how we came up with that number is we just solved for that 10% base premium of $100,000. That gave us the $1.4 million death benefit. Then we've got these other riders. LISR is life insurance supplement rider. That's a combination of money going toward term and PUAs. The term cost is not 39.5. It's closer to about 10 grand, but we can get the exact there. The rest toward PUAs. Scheduled Ailer, additional life insurance rider, just a pure PUA payment. And then we've got a renewable term rider, which actually has a level premium for the first 10 years. Based on the non-guarantees, the company does reserve the right to increase that, but the first 10 years it does remain level, again, based on their current expenses and such. But breakdown as to where the money's going, all of this other stuff, we've got, we can explain what all these columns mean, we've got videos that do that, but here's the most important piece. Annual outlay, that's my total out of pocket. Net cash value, end year, this is the net cash value that you have access to. It's based on the present dividend rate. Rate We do want to track this over time, but net cash value, sometimes this reads total cash value with some companies, that is your money column. After all of fees, expenses, everything that comes with the life insurance policy, and then after they apply the guaranteed rate, dividends everything, and everything, that's your money column right there. And then net death benefit on the far right, the net dollar amount that is paid out to your beneficiaries, if you were to die. And your beneficiary in this case uh, may very well be a trust. So breakdown as to where the money is going. And then we've got the other four illustrate, other three illustrations for the other three scenarios we will look at. So ah, one more thing, almost forgot. Bottom right hand corner, that $13.3 million death benefit. Look at this. Guess where we came up with it? $1 million MEC limit meaning we're solving for the minimum death benefit possible to minimize costs in order to be able to pay up to $1 million per year. That is the name of the game. All right, so let's take a look here. We looked at option A, which was best case. Next option, varying payments. What do we see here? This will be pretty neat to check out. We've got a million dollars years one and two. Things are going according to plan. Then life happens. My base premium is what? 
$100,000. Got some term rider costs as well, which we cover that in a little bit more, paying in $150 per year. When's the break even? Still year four. Here's what I'll add. If you redline a policy in the first two years, meaning here we're 10xing the base premium, we're funding up to the MEC limit of a million dollars, often you'll see a break even between years four and five. It does depend on our age and health. Sometimes it could be year six, but if you max it out in the first and second year where the expenses are very, very heavy, you put yourself in a very, very good position in the event that life happens and you can't pay anything in or just a reduced amount, you still see a strong internal rate of return, an early break even point, and it's moving forward. This way, if life happens and you need access to cash, you're not looking at the policy feeling like, man, I lost money here. I still haven't, haven't even recouped my cash value. It's there and things are moving forward so we can progress forward as well. And that's the case if it's a million, if it's 100,000, even if it's 10,000 per year. But here's the 150. And then here's where it gets cool. So here, here's nine and 10, two more payments of a million bucks. So we can do this with a mass mutual policy if it's designed properly. We can even go higher and make catch up payments. But you do need to have the proper riders on. If we just go with a standard PUA blend with a mass mutual product, we won't be able to do this. Underwriting would be required to go that long. So we go years three through eight with a reduced payment and then a big catch-up payment, which here we've got on the illustration. Come on, there we go. So there's our million million, 150 all the way through year eight. And then beginning year nine, you've got a million dollar payment. And how that's done is when we look at the one year term rider over here, if that's attached, that's what allows a policyholder to make big PUA catch-up payments without any underwriting. Because what happens here is when you throw a million bucks in, what, you'll, what do you notice about that term rider? Drops quite a bit. Look at the pr year prior. Drops by 100K, then drops by about 1.5 million. Another big drop. What's happening is when you make big, big PUA payments into a policy, we do it for cash value, but those also buy us additional death benefit. You can actually see that in this column right here. So cash value of additions represents money you pay into PUAs, then also dividends that are added to the policy. So interest earned to the PUA payments, it excludes any base premium payments and cash value build up from base premium dollars. But then the column to the right, total paid up additions beginning year represents how much additional whole life death benefit is purchased from your PUA payments. So what you'll notice here is when you make a big PUA payment down, down at years nine and 10, look how much additional whole life death benefit is purchased, quite a bit. Now, if we don't have the right term rider attached to the policy, a lot of times an insurance company will say, no, we will not accept that unless you go through medical underwriting because they view that as an added liability. Did you find out you're just diagnosed with a serious illness and you might die soon and you're trying to cash in for your beneficiaries? This is the kind of stuff they're going to underwrite for. So how you prevent it is if you have a one-year term rider attached, when you make those big payments, well, the net death benefit does not take a huge jump. What happens is the term is just bought down naturally. That also decreases the cost of the term. So that's how we often build in a ton of flexibility with these policies when someone wants the flexibility and then measure it measure it and see what it looks like if we can't make the additional payments either. Okay, so here we've got the funding, still breaks even year four and looks great as the years pass. He's gotten a total of 4.9 million into the policy and just lets it ride. After the 10th year, he doesn't wanna pay anything in. Now what do we have? Life happens scenario. What's this look like? Well, what do we see? One million years one and two, and then pays just about the minimum, slightly more, initially at least. When's the break even? Still year four, because we redlined it in the first and second year. Cash value continues to grow. You got about three million in. Keeps on growing over time. One more, shall we? One million only for the first year. This was stop early, the fourth option. So there's your $1 million payment and then just 500K per year through the fifth year. So you got a total of 3 million in. 
As we look at this guy, though, what do you notice about the break-even? It's not quite year four. All of the other examples are because we maxed it out years one and two. Here, you're close, but you're not there. You're $25,000 short, a little bit less than that. <laughs> Next year, you're positive, year five. But the reason why, it's a minor difference, but we like to highlight it, the reason why is because we only max funded it the first year. And we can continue to pay in, we can make catch up payments to make up for lost time and then things are great. But here we go, continues to appreciate over time. This will look good compared to the example on the left. Not a huge difference, but you will see it look attractive here. Slightly more in cash value, you paid in another 40 grand. So there's about that difference there, but attractive. We're just getting the money in quicker and we've only max funded one year. So it's still not a bad option in the event that I wanted to stop early and reduce my payments. The last thing we would look at in a case like this is the internal rate of return. Not the last thing, but another thing we would look at. So for example, if we wanted to pick the IRR in a couple of them, why don't we do all of them real quick and I'll show you how we do that quickly. We could throw the annualized IRR in here in about two seconds, um, but let's just get the average as well. A lot of people do like to see the average. Um, I've noticed that over the years, myself included, especially with larger dollar amounts. The annual is nice, often when I'm looking at loan strategies and comparing, hey, what did it grow by this year? And what was my cost to borrow? Let me check it out over here. This was after the 10th year zero. Good. And what we'll do, copy. There we go. Paste it as text. There's my annualized IRR and also the average. What we'll see over here, let's look at this guy. What's cool about this, you just get to see everything side by side. And in order to check all of this, what you'll want to do is look at it on the detailed illustration as well. You'll actually see that. Here's the 500K example right here. And this will display the, the um, average internal rate of return. So we always wanna make sure these numbers match what we see on the Excel comparison sheet. Um, and then for the annual internal rate of return, um, we can plug that in as well. It's pretty, it's much easier to calculate. Um, but with Mass Mutual, it's actually referred to in their software as one year rate of return. So here's our annual that calculated. Pull it up, pull it up. All right, so there we go. We've got the IRRs all there, looking how they should look. One thing I'll highlight here is if you're looking at the annual IRR, you'll actually notice in cases like this, like the first two years, they're identical. Look at year three. The example where you paid more into the policy has a lower internal rate of return than the example why you paid less. The reason why has to do with the PUA fees. However, as time passes, you'll always see the net result of overfunding a policy, adding more and more into PUAs, is greater cash value, stronger average internal rate of return, if you compare the two, and more money really at the end of the day. Um, so you will see a positive net result long-term really after the, the year after you make the PUA payment if you're maxing it out as opposed to reducing the PUA payment. However, if you're in a situation where life happens and you do reduce your PUA payments or you just reduce it because, you will see a little bit stronger internal rate of return because you're paying less in. So there's, there's a, a fee still, cut one, two, three. So you're paying less in, the fee is still assessed, but it's assessed on a smaller dollar amount. So as a result, you see a little bit stronger IRR, which you know, is nice more than anything else. But anyway, hope you enjoyed this one as far as just the pattern or the uh, process will take a lot of individuals through when looking at these scenarios. Um, often we'll show a couple uh, just to keep things simple. And if you ask for more, we definitely will show more. And if you're leaning toward a certain scenario, 
but I see it and say, hey, here's what I might look at instead, or here's something to be aware of, we'll definitely provide that uh, to you or your advisors or attorneys, whoever's reviewing it with you. So I hope you enjoyed this one. If you did, uh, please hit the like button, subscribe for more. And as always, I hope this helps. Thank you so much. Hey guys, Steve Parisi here. If you enjoyed the content you just saw, please subscribe, like, and hit the notification bell for future videos. If you'd like more information or to see some custom policies for yourself, feel free to call or email our offices at the contact information below.